Thank you for your faithfulness, and I know I appreciate it, and if I do, how much more the Lord does. So I thank you for your faithfulness, and I thank those who have joined us online. I thank you as well. And before I get started, I want to say that last week I told you that I had an MRI done on, uh, for my cancer uh, checkup, and the, I got the results, and the results are good. Um, they have no evidence of the, the cancer has returned. Um, they will not say I am cancer free yet, and I have to tell you that I have been diagnosed since 2007, and I am still under the doctor's care. But I told the Lord I don't quite understand that, but I know you have a plan. There's a reason why you still have me under his care. So I see him next month, and we will start a new plan for next year. He'll tell me what the plan is, which uh, hopefully isn't too much, and uh, we'll continue on. And I'm trusting the Lord for his salvation is what I'm actually trusting for. And his heart has been softened each time that I go in to see him. So I am trusting that I even asked him to watch our services online. So I am trusting that he's been doing that. And I will ask him that when I see him. But I'm just trusting that the Lord has a reason why he wants me to continue to see him. So tonight I want to share what the Lord has put on my heart. Before I do, let's pray. The Lord, I thank you for another opportunity I have to come and to share your word. And Lord, I thank you for these who've come out. And Lord, that you have a message for each one of us. So I just pray, Lord, you would open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive what you would have this night. And anything that is accomplished, we'll be sure to give you the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, last week I spoke on counting your blessings. And I said, this is the Thanksgiving month, all month, and so the Lord is, my heart is in the Thanksgiving direction, and I said to count your blessings, not just this month, this week, but all year long, and that when we have a heart of gratitude, it changes our perspective on a lot of things. So I said to, to count your blessings. So I hope that you've been doing that this week, and we've been singing the song, count your blessings, name them one by one, and I hope that you've been singing that throughout the week that you've just been counting your blessings. And tonight, if I could title my message, it would be Harvest Day, Harvest Day. And while it may seem obvious that when we plant corn, we harvest corn. And when we plant tomato seeds, we harvest tomato, tomatoes. Whatever seeds you plant is what you harvest. But tonight, I want to talk about a different type of harvest. So let's take a look at Galatians chapter 7, looking at verses 7 through 10, or chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. We sometimes deny the relationship between sowing and reaping in our spiritual lives. We don't, sometimes we don't put that together. But I would say to you, suppose... Jesus declared today, Harvest Day. Suppose he did that in our lives. And he asked us to gather up the yield of our everyday choices over the past year. What would you have to show him? What would you have to show him? For this past year, if he said today is Harvest Day, what would you have to show him? The condition of our hearts determines whether the seed of God's grace takes root in our lives and produces the fruit of his kingdom. Let me say that again. The condition of our hearts determine whether the seed of God's grace takes root in our lives and produces the fruit of his kingdom. You see, God has appointed us to carry our sowing into his fields. What is his field? the world in which we live, the people in which we see. That is his field. That is where he is wanting us to sow into. So the spiritual seeds of love and goodness, a touch, touch of comfort here, a word of counsel there, a gift to meet a need, these will give lasting 
harvest. These will give us lasting harvest. And Dave and I have been youth pastors for years, years. And we had a couple boys in there that their dad was not a Christian. And they came to our group, and they came for quite a while. And then their dad decided he didn't want them in our group anymore because he didn't serve the Lord. So they left our group. They went into the world. They were just in high school. And the younger one got in a lot of trouble, and he ended up in prison. And he said, we, years later, Dave and I saw him in a restaurant. And I kept looking at him, and he kept looking at us, and I kept thinking, I know I should know him, but I'm not quite sure where I know him, because he did a lot of changing from high school to an adult. So I just couldn't figure who, who he was. And he came up to us, and he says, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, well, I, I've been sitting here thinking I should know you, but I'm not quite sure where I know you from. And he goes, I was in your youth group. And he said, my dad didn't want us there to go anymore. And he said, and I got in a lot of trouble, and I ended up in prison. He said, but I want to tell you that when I was sitting in prison, all I could remember are the words that you and Dave spoke in youth. They kept coming back to me. He said, and finally I asked a guard for a Bible. And he said, and I gave my heart to the Lord in that prison cell. He says, and now I'm out, and I have a three-year-old son, and I am trying to teach him the ways of the Lord. Harvest, what we plant, will make a harvest down the road. If I would have never saw him, I would have no idea what kind of seed was planted, but I do know this. The seeds that Dave and I planted, and, and we've done this for years, there'll be a harvest when all is said and done. I wouldn't have known that, except that I ran into him. But in heaven, I would have known that, because he would be there. So a harvest, what are we planting? What seeds are we planting? I have said many times that God wants to use you. I've said that many times. I have said that God delights in taking um, the most unusual circumstances. He chooses the most unlikely people to do the most extraordinary that's what he does. He gives each one of us different talents to be used for his glory. What are you doing with those talents? But I want to remind you, you have a choice. You always have a choice to either go with what the Lord is asking you to do or not go with what he's asking you to do. When we turn a deaf ear to that still, small voice that whispers to us, we miss out on what God wants us to do in us, for us, and through us. We miss out when we turn a deaf ear. And I think of the rich young rulers. I want us to look at that, Luke chapter 18. And we're going to look at verses 18 to 23. And it says, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false te testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I've kept. I was a boy, he said, since I was a boy. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have. Give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. In another version of it, in, in Mark, it says, when it gets to the chapter, verse 22, it, before Jesus says, one thing you lack, he says, he looked at him and loved him. He looked at him and loved him. How much the Lord loves each one of us, even when we're not doing exactly what we're supposed to. He looks at us and he loves us. But he told him, there's one thing that you lack. You see, he was a religious man, and note, note, religion and a relationship with Jesus is two different things, two different things. And so he was a religious man. He kept the commandments since he was a boy. He kept them. But it really made no difference in his life because when Jesus asked him to sell everything he had to the poor and sell it and give to the poor, and then, he got a personal invitation by Jesus to follow him. 
and that's huge. He gets a personal invitation by Jesus to follow him. It says he went away sad because he was a man of great wealth. His money meant more to him than following Jesus. It meant more to him. What seed was he planting? I'm going to tell you he was planting selfishness. He wouldn't let go. He wouldn't let go. Jesus would have had him go on a journey of a lifetime. The disciples did. And he said, follow me. Right then he said, follow me. And he didn't go. But he made a choice. He couldn't sell, or I'm sorry, he couldn't see himself without his wealth. He couldn't see his life without his wealth. If we take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, it says, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And this just isn't talking about money. It's talking about our time, our talents, and our gifts that the Lord has given us. It's talking about all of that. So if, if we only give a little bit of our, of our money, of our time, of our talents, of our gifts, then we're only going to reap a little bit. But if we give generously, then we're going to reap generously of what we have given. And that's just the way it works with the Lord. If you give little, then you get little back. But if you give generously, he gives you a lot back. I'm going to say look for, listen for, and watch for it daily, the responses to his nudges and opportunities, because they're there. Daily, he gives us opportunity to sow seed. Daily. He has a plan for you to plant his spiritual seeds of love and goodness, a touch of comfort, a word of counsel, and a gift to meet a need. He does that daily. Maybe, just maybe, you feel you're not good enough, smart enough, or talented enough for God to use you in a mighty way. And I will tell you, God loves inviting the incapable to show just how capable he is. That's what he's looking for. When you say yes to God, despite your inabilities, you will become a living, breathing, walking display of his glory. That's what you'll become. Are you willing to abandon that which makes you feel comfortable, to embrace that which makes you fulfilled. You see, the rich young ruler was not. He lived a very comfortable life, and he wasn't willing to let that go. And yet he knew he was lacking something because he came and asked Jesus, what must I do to in in inherit eternal life? He knew his life was missing something. If he would have sold all that he had, given to the poor, and followed Jesus, he would have been fulfilled. But in this case, you never hear about the rich young ruler again in the scriptures. That's the last time you hear of him. I will tell you, remember Satan has a way of beating us up with life. Using our own negative self-talk to create doubt in our hearts. Satan is a deceiver and a liar. If we listen to him, then we sit on the sidelines and begin to believe that others are more qualified than we are. And we won't do anything significant for God. We will just sit. And when we pray, I will tell you, the Holy Spirit will remind you of the calling the Lord has placed on your life, whatever it might be, to be used by God to make a difference for God. So I would say, bring a little bit of God's kingdom, just a bit of God's king, to a world caught in Satan's grip. Bring the kingdom to them. Then we have a choice. We have a choice to make. We have a choice. Which voice will we follow? The voice of Satan, or the liar, or the voice of God? We have to decide to believe what God once did, he still longs to do. Underneath the truth, each of us needs to realize that one of the most 
unlikely people he wants to use is you and me. He wants to use us for his glory. There's a prayer that goes like this. Things of the world often pull at my heart, but Lord, help me to see the end from the start. Open my eyes to where my life's going, what I will reap from all I've been sowing. And that's by K. P. Ham. Open my eyes to where my life is going, because what I've been sowing is what you're going to reap. That is what you're going to reap. Planting love, seeds of, and I'm going to ask you, are you planting love, compassion, forgiveness, righteousness, and grace? Or rather, seeds of neglect, selfishness, immorality, and corruption, bitterness, anger, and unforgiveness. Our answers determine the fruit our lives will yield and the, and the peace or the turmoil we will have in the future by what we are planting today. And I would like to read you two stories and from Daily Guidepost 2021. And it sort of brings home what I'm trying to say. It says, during my recent visit to my hometown in Maryland, my family and I attended our former church for Sunday morning service. I attended this church during my college years, and my family's history there is rich. This is the church where my husband and I exchanged wedding vows, where we had our firstborn son's child dedication, and where God built my spiritual foundation. During the service, we enjoyed a lively worship, singing along and raising our hands in praise to God, music that uplifted God. We listened to a challenging sermon. We also reconnected with old friends who have known us since we were 20-something youth ministry leaders. Then a young woman approached our pew. She reached over to embrace me, and she remarked, You might not remember me, but the first time I visited this church, you were the first person to share how to begin a relationship with God. As she spoke, my mind transported back to the outreach ministry. I had served many years ago. At the end of this service, each Sunday, our team would connect with anyone needing prayer, and occasionally someone would step forward wanting to begin a faith walk with Christ. Suddenly, I remembered sharing scripture and praying with this young woman over two decades ago. Visiting our old church gave me a small glimpse into the impact I had had in this woman's life. It also encouraged me to continue seeking opportunities to affect others' lives, even today, whether or not I am blessed to witness the impact or the results. That's what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to plant seeds. Uh, and for people who come in for the first time, they'll remember who has spoken to them, who has shown them love. They'll remember that. So I encourage you to plant that seed of hospitality, of love, to come in into the church because they will remember that. The second one I want you to, to read is, says, over the years, I attended many funerals. My grandparents, parents, aunts, and uncles have all passed away. Friends and neighbors have died, some tragically. As a church organist, I have participated in funerals for people I didn't know. Most of the services were a blessing, and many included some humorous moments. When Don's uncle died, the pastor chuckled and said he was an ornery old guy before reading the obituary that summarized his life accomplishments. Recently, though, I attended a service that was different. The women's obituary listed surviving family members, but didn't min mention any educational attainments, activities, memberships, or achievements. I wondered what life had been like. How did she spend her time? Was she bored? Did she know Jesus? My questions were answered when the pastor asked if anybody would like to make remarks. Person after person stood to speak. She opened her home and heart to me when we lost our home. She took me in when I was pregnant and unmarried. She bailed me out of jail and helped me get a job that I still have. Without her pushing me, I wouldn't have finished high school. When the pastor asked how many people present had been touched by her kindness, almost everyone stood up. No activities or accomplishments? Only the most crucial one of all, she loved. She loved in word and action. She loved without judgment or condemnation. 
And isn't that all Jesus asked for us to do? Love, another seed to plant love. So I'd ask you, take a look at your life. What are you planting? What seeds are you planting for the kingdom? What talent has God given you that you are using? Because it's a whole lot more than just going to work or to school or whatever we do. It's a whole lot more than that. It's planting those seeds of love and kindness, of reaching out to the lost. The world is waiting for those talents to be unleashed for God's glory. Harvest day. What will you show him if he asked today? What would you be able to show him? The seeds we sow today will determine the fruit we will reap tomorrow. And that's what I want to leave you with tonight. That not just get the seeds that you're sowing. What are they? Are they of good and not of evil? Will they minister to hearts? It's love. Love is huge to a world that doesn't know him that those seeds that we plant, the kindness and all of that, makes a huge difference in people's lives. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this opportunity I've had to share your word. And Lord, if today